There is hardly anything better than belonging to a group of really cool dudes. And among the great figures of ancient Greece, there are seven who perhaps stood above all the rest. They are regarded as the seven sages of ancient Greece. They are, as described in one of Plato's dialogues, Chilon of Sparta, who was a politician, Solon of Athens, who was a statesman and poet, Pittacus of Mytilene, who was a military general, Mycen of Cannae, who as yet hasn't done a face reveal, but if his peers give us anything to go off of, he probably looked like a rock, Bias of Preen, who was a politician, Cleobulus of Lindos, who was a tyrant and poet, these men earn great respect for their wisdom, virtues, contributions to political thought and philosophy, and for some, their poetry. But there was one man among this group who might have been the grandson of Cleobulus, who outcooled them all. And that was Thales of Miletus. He was born around 640 BC in Miletus. His city was on the western coast of Asia Minor, near what is today Aydin, Turkey. In his time, Thales earned fame as a philosopher and astronomer, but for us, he is most cool because he is regarded as the first mathematician. Now, what does that title even mean? Well, a more clear title that is often also used to describe him is that he is the father of demonstrative mathematics. This means that he was the first known person to actually demonstrate geometric statements to be true. In so doing, he introduced logical proof. Thus, his mathematical statements weren't it might be, or it could be, or it should be, or it seems to be, but after a logical proof, it must be. I want to share with you some of the amusing stories that are told of Thales' life, as well as some of his impressive mathematics. We'll see the facts that Record says he was the first one to ever prove, and we'll go through a potential proof that he might have used for one of those claims. As with any legendary ancient figure, it's impossible for us to separate the myth from the fact, but the stories and the truth together paint a very interesting picture of this man. One very very interesting fact is that he may have been Pythagoras's teacher. He is said to have recognized Pythagoras's genius at a young age and then went on to teach him everything he knew. Among the droves of people who respond to mathematics with a gurgling sickness in their stomach and an aghast expression on their face, there is perhaps no name which invokes this feeling so strongly as Pythagoras. And it is possible that all those Pythagoras haters have the mind of Thales to thank for bringing the genius out of the young Pythagoras. Thales spent his early years engaged in commercial ventures, and it is supposed that during his travels he learned mathematics from the Egyptians and learned astronomy from the Babylonians. One of his mythical feats in astronomy was his prediction of the solar eclipse in the year 585 BC. Although a more realistic view of this legend may be that Thales just made a lucky guess, or the people of his time, shocked at the occurrence of the eclipse, must have just thought that Thales, being the wise man that he was, had foreseen it. Aristotle recalls another story about Thales, in which years had passed without the olive trees producing fruit. This would not be good for those who ran the olive presses, but Thales, foreseeing good weather in the years to come, bought up all of the olive presses around Miletus. Some say that having a monopoly on the olive presses, he was able to earn a great sum from his investment, whereas others say he sold at a reasonable price, having proved his point that a philosopher could earn great wealth if he wished. Yet another fanciful story is told of Thales, in which he walked through the town one starry night. Gazing fixedly upon those stars which so enchanted him, he did not see in front of him stood a well which he, sploosh, promptly fell into. You can imagine being out at this hour and witnessing this foolishness, how you would certainly rush to the local historian to tell him this tale which would last thousands of years. Another story told by Aesop involves one of Thales' mules. It is said there was a stream over which this mule often had to pass. The mule, perhaps traveling to the market, was loaded up with bags of salt. 
And by happy coincidence, the mule found that if he fell over in the stream, much of the salt would dissolve, thus lightening his load. The mule began to repeat this behavior, dumping salt into the stream trip after trip, which did not make Thales a happy fella. So for the next trip, he hatched a very devious plan. Instead of filling the saddlebags with salt, for this trip, Thales filled the saddlebags with sponges. And you can imagine the shock of the mule when he tried to dump his weight into the stream next time and his burden became significantly heavier. And with that, the problem was solved. Another cruel story of Thales concerns him and his contemporary, Solon of Athens. It is said Solon asked Thales why he never married. To answer his question, Thales arranged for a messenger to deliver Solon news of the death of his son. According to the ancient biographer Plutarch, upon receiving this news, Solon began to beat his head and to do and say all that is usual with men in transports of grief. But Thales took his hand and with a smile said, These things, Solon, keep me from marriage and rearing children, which are too great for even your constancy to support. However, be not concerned at the report, for it is a fiction. Now, having seen Thales intelligent and devious in each equal parts, what are some of the mathematical claims attributed to him as him being the first to prove them? It is said that he proved the sides of similar triangles are proportional, that an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle, that the base angles of an isosceles triangle are congruent, that vertical angles are equal, that a circle is bisected by its diameter, and that the angle sum of a triangle equals to right angles, or 180 degrees. And he put his geometrical know-how to great use. It is said that the king of Egypt was very impressed by his use of this fact, that sides of similar triangles are proportional, in order to measure the height of the Great Pyramid of Giza. The pyramid, if looked at from the side, is an isosceles triangle. And of course, as the sun beams down on it, it casts a shadow with some length. Of course, the distance Thales was trying to find was this distance, the height of the pyramid. Thales already knew that the distance across the pyramid was 756 feet, which meant that this distance from the center to the edge was 378 feet. Then, at the very end of the pyramid's shadow, he placed his staff, which he knew to be six feet tall. The staff, also being beamed upon by the sun, casts its own shadow, and this then creates a smaller triangle, which is similar to the big one. Having this small triangle, similar to this big one, Thales only needed to measure the shadow cast by his staff, which was nine feet, and the distance from the edge of the pyramid to the tip of its shadow, which was 342 feet. Thus, this total base length of the big triangle was 378 plus 342, or 720. Since the sides of similar triangles are proportional, Thales said that the ratio of this base to this one, which is 720 to 9, must be equal to the ratio of the height to this staff height, so that's h over 6. It was then easy to solve this equation for h and arrive at a height for the Great Pyramid of 480 feet. And for its time, such a measurement was undeniably impressive. Imagine walking up to this massive pyramid, holding nothing but a staff in your hand, and walking away knowing the height of the pyramid before you. It is said that Thales used a similar method in order to calculate how far a ship was from shore. It is likely that he may have stood atop an observation tower on the coast. He would then have a line of sight out to the ship that was at sea. He could then use a simple instrument consisting of two legs that formed a right angle to see at what point this rod intersected his line of sight with the ship. Knowing that point on the rod, he would just need to measure that length, call it y. He would need to know his own height as he stands atop the observation tower, say that's h, and he would of course need to know how high up the observation tower takes him, call that l. With those three quantities known, and then having similar triangles, he would be able to find x, the distance from the coast 
to the ship. These are some of Thales' most impressive accomplishments, though I think for us as math people, his most impressive feat was the introduction of logical proof. So let's take a quick look at how he might have proven one of these statements. One of the statements credited to him is that an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. How is this proven? Well, let me give you my best shot at a semicircle. That is half a circle. It would look something like this. Let's say that this is the center of the semicircle. We'll call that O. An arbitrary angle inscribed in a semicircle would look something like this. Now notice from the center, we have a radius here and a radius there. So it will actually be advantageous to draw another radius going from the center to that vertex A of the inscribed angle. We then have three congruent segments. These segments are all congruent because they are all radii of the semicircle. So we have an isosceles triangle here, which Thales had previously proven would have congruent base angles. This angle and this angle, those which are opposite the congruent sides, must have the same measure. Perhaps we call both of those alpha. Similarly, over here, we have an isosceles triangle, congruent sides. So as Thales knew, those base angles had to be congruent. Let's say they had measures of beta. Then Thales already knew that the angle sum of this whole big triangle had to be equal to two right angles, which of course is the same as 180 degrees. Now, one way to express the angle sum of this big triangle is alpha plus alpha plus beta plus beta, or two alpha plus two beta. We can then divide both sides of this equation by two to find that 90 degrees is equal to two alpha divided by two is alpha, and two beta divided by two is beta. So alpha plus beta equals 90 degrees. What is alpha plus beta? Well, it happens to be the angle measure of that inscribed angle. The inscribed angle has a measure of alpha plus beta. We've just shown that's 90 degrees. It is a right angle. Thus, as was to be demonstrated, an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle, and that's possibly how Thales proved it. Suffice to say, he was an incredible mind. And we have him to thank for kickstarting the rigor, which is at the core of mathematics today Day, and perhaps also for Pythagoras. Let me know in the comments if you had any questions or any interesting stories about the seven sages that you'd like to share, and be sure to subscribe for more of the swankiest math lessons on the internet. I'm unstable, I'm feeling hard to keep the cable cut and unsort the table. If Texas instruments don't reply, well, I think this time it might be fatal. I wish to sell my own fake, cause I'm jaded. Hate the odds that I calculated. Press and pull and pray and push it all the way through the whole blue planet faded. Psychosomatic habits, why you so, so.